The King of Comedy, 1982 film made by Martin Scorsese starring Robert De Niro. It's an interesting case for me because it is a film that does pop up in internet discussions between cinephiles and people more involved with, uh, with cinema, but I feel it's not as alive in the wider mainstream consciousness as some of the other collaborations between Scorsese and De Niro, like Taxi Driver, Goodfellas, uh, Raging Bull or Casino. It's interesting because I feel like um, The King of Comedy may be overlooked. Uh, if I had to rank those collaborations, I think um, that this film would likely be right on top with, along with Taxi Driver. Uh, I'm also not mentioning both of them together by accident. Both Scorsese and De Niro, De Niro have gone on record um, saying that these films were intended to be reminiscent of one another and that The King of Comedy should be treated as a spiritual um, successor to Taxi Driver. And they both have been mentioned by Todd Phillips and uh, Joaquin Phoenix as the main inspirations behind the upcoming Joker film, which I'm very excited about. So having previously seen Taxi Driver and loved it, uh, I now sat down to watch the other film and see what I've been missing on. Uh, so in The King of Comedy, uh, the Nero plays Rupert uh, Pupkin, a struggling comedian who is not really performing anywhere, but instead lives inside his head for most of the time, imagining himself being loved and cherished and respected by the wide audiences. He seems to be living in the basement of his mother's house, which he made up to be a sort of mock version of a TV studio, complete with cardboard cutouts of uh, TV personalities. So Rupert routinely gets lost in his imagination, going into all those scenarios and visions where he's being interviewed about his life and career and success uh, and the actual plot of the film opens with him managing to get himself onto a car ride with Jerry Langford, his idol and a famous comedian and late night whole, uh, show host. So Rupert tries to convince Jerry that he is the next big thing, that the next talent on the radar and that uh, Jerry should take him on the show and give him a chance. Uh, Jerry, to get rid of this very clearly a <laughs> psycho fan, uh, tells Rupert to contact him later, uh, which he then, you know, tries to do, obviously tries following up on this. And he starts calling Jerry's office, he starts visiting it personally, um, even trying to, to find Jerry himself out on the street. And in general, he's becoming more and more harassing. Um, so I think that the film has this dual nature to itself. On the one hand, it is a character study, especially in the first half, of a man that lives, as I said, inside his head and is losing his touch with reality slowly, not the least because of his loneliness in the world. We see Rupert have these delusions of grandeur and imagining himself as being on top of the world. In this way, in this character study aspect, the film is very reminiscent of Taxi Driver indeed. Um, yet at the same time, it doesn't feel like it's an unnecessary copy. It doesn't feel like it's doing the same thing again. It takes a similar fundamental setup, but then goes into a completely different direction with it. Uh, at this point, I have to say that I was hugely impressed with Robert De Niro in the role. Uh, sure, we all know he's a terrific actor when he wants to be, and a case can really be made that he's one of the best movie actors of all time based on his wide body of work, at least up until the 90s when he apparently stopped giving a fuck and started doing silly comedies for a paycheck. But for me, the King of Comedy really showed his capabilities and his range as an actor because it's such a different role to the other ones he's known for. Um, he is creepy and pathetic and even scary at times as Rupert, but at the same time he manages to bring this unique manic energy to the role, um, to, which, which is very unlike him um, and unlike his other roles, for example, Taxi Driver. The second large aspect of the film itself is that it's a huge critique on the celebrity culture in America. We see the insanity that Rupert and his uh, so-called friend Masha uh, slowly succumb to. We see how they put Jerry on the pedestal and don't even really consider him an, a normal human being, a living person, just this larger of life celebrity, um, celebrity figure that they want to be friends with at all costs, that they want to be similar to. And then we also get to see Jerry's perspective. There are scenes where he's walking around uh, around town, walking down the street, trying to get lunch. 
and he gets recognized all the time, asked for an autograph, for a picture, smiled at, yes, but also quite often pretty much harassed. It's made very clear that he doesn't enjoy his fame and that he's under a lot of pressure because of this worship all around him and that, that public image of him uh, as a jovial comedian is contrasted with scenes of him, for example, eating alone at his hotel room with a tired and angry expression on his face. Um, I think that this aspect is also amazingly well done uh, and at times completely terrifying in its accuracy, especially as despite the fact that the movie is now almost 40 years old, it, it hasn't aged a day. I mean, the celebrity culture has not gone away. Um, in fact, it's probably much worse than it ever was before uh, what with the advent of internet social media and streaming platforms we live in a time when uh, so many people have those delusions of grandeur so well portrayed in the film setting up fan pages for for themselves on the internet uh, instagram profiles twitch streams blogs vlogs youtube channels yes i'm probably criticizing myself now to a, to a degree all in a all in a vain attempt to to be famous without necessarily doing anything worth being famous for. Uh, and this is another thing I want to touch on. Throughout the film we keep seeing Rupert imagine himself in interviews and loose conversations and we keep hearing him say that he's got great material, that he's funny, that he's a great comedian with talent and potential. But up until the very end we never actually see him performing or even just practicing his material, his, his jokes, his stand-up routine. That's all the more mind-blowing because you see this man who already has clear, detailed plans for uh, when he can reap the rewards and the benefits of his work and the appreciation for that work, but is never actually seen working. And the last thing I want to discuss is um, the very last scene of the film, uh, which is a fantastic open ending, uh, which I love open endings. There are two possible interpretations to it, and the way Scorsese shoots that scene within the context of the movie makes it so they both deliberately make perfect sense. And regardless of which ending version you choose to believe, um, you can not only make a, a good argument for it being the correct one, but what's more impressive is that both offer some really deep uh, commentary as a consequence of them. They're really thought out. Uh, I won't tell what exactly happens and what are those interpretations. I don't want to spoil it and they're both quite clear to recognize when you see them, when you see the ending. Uh, what I will do is just strongly recommend this movie to everyone. I think it is absolutely terrific, despite some minor pacing issues in the in the second half. And not only is it a great film on its own, it is even better in tandem with Taxi Driver. Um, and in light of all the positive buzz about Joker and the fact that much of the king of the comedy, the king of comedy, can be seen in the trailers for Joker. And the fact that De Niro himself is also involved in the upcoming film, I can't help but be even more excited for it.